Bueno, seguimos en el Centro Espacial Kennedy y la verdad es que un privilegio que uno se puede dar eh, estando trabajando acá. Eh, tengo la chance de poder hablar con Jessica Mir. Jessica, eh, seguramente ya la conocen, eh, astronauta, ya estuvo más de 200 días en la estación espacial, parte de aquella famosa eh, eh, caminata espacial con, con, Christina, con Christina Koch y ahora entrenando para futuras misiones Artemis. Voy a hacer la entrevista en inglés porque ella habla poco y nada de español, pero después voy a poner subtítulos. How are you, Jessica? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for your time. How are you? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's wonderful to be here and be sharing all this with everybody all around the world. How how do you feel? You know, I had the I had the chance to to talk to several people working at NASA from uh, public relations to uh, EGS to, and they are all so excited. Tell me your vision from the astronaut corps. How to get to this point? Yeah, to get to this point, it's huge. You know, we have been working on this mission to return to the moon for a very long time now. And I would say as an astronaut, it's really interesting because it always seemed to me very far off. It was off in the distant future. I was focused on my first mission to the International Space Station. That was very real. You know, we've been flying to the space station for uh -huh. two decades now. So this has kind of seemed more like a dream. But being here at the Kennedy Space Center, seeing the rocket on the launch pad just over there, you know, seeing the capsules being built in the facilities here at, at KSC, it suddenly becomes real. And we realize that This isn't just a dream. We're doing it now. We have started the program, and with this launch, this will be the official start of the missions. So it's an incredibly exciting time. Do you feel ready? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we don't have to be ready quite yet because there are no humans, as an astronaut True. anyway, there are no humans on this one, but this one is all about all the engineers and the ground teams that have put so much into this mission. And, you know, we have been, as astronauts, con co contributing as well in terms of looking at different pieces of hardware, especially for those later missions, which will, the next missions after this one, which will have humans on board. So we will be ready, and that's the way we do things at NASA. We won't launch until we're ready, and so that, you know, that's what happened the other day. We weren't ready. We uncovered a few technical issues that yep. we had to solve first. Yep. So we'll see if we can get there on Saturday, if we're ready and we have the weather cooperate. But if not, we have more opportunities. The goal is not to rush it. The goal is to do it right because yeah. the next mission will have humans on it. You know, I wanted to ask you because I remember you've been on the space station for like 200 days, a little bit more than 200 days. 205. Uh, in a very special moment because when in the middle of the pandemic or when the pandemic was starting, And then you came, you came back with a very different world. People wearing yeah. masks. Do you think that helped you to set your mind for a future mission where you're alone with a few amount of people and then coming back to something that is different? Yeah, maybe so. I think you captured exactly the sentiment of what we felt like. We returned to a completely different planet and, and that was an extreme situation because we were so removed from it. You know, I think it was more gradual for people on the Earth as the reality sunk in and for us it was life as normal on the space station. Coming back from space is always a bit strange and requires an adjustment, but coming back to an entirely new planet was something else. And You know, the two things have a lot of parallels. We sent down some videos about how to live in isolation and confinement, something we do regularly in space, keeping a schedule, exercising, communication, <laughs> all those things. Social distance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we'll see, you know, I think all of these challenges that we face in our life, not just for us as astronauts, but really for all humans, all of these challenges push us further and prepare us for the next one. You know, um, what's the main difference between, what I think we all know, but between Apollo and Artemis? Uh, being you a scientist, mm -hmm. uh, a biologist, and you are already preparing, maybe for the first missions, uh, which is an extreme different situation from Apollo. Right. Our first scientist in Apollo was in Apollo 17, Harrison Smith, mm -hmm. and maybe the astronauts right now are, it's, it's a different combination of, from Marine Corps or Army or scientists. That's, that's maybe one of the main difference besides the international cooperation? Yeah, I mean, we are in a different era. Obviously, there are huge technological differences, but I think you've captured it. It really is a different mission now because of the people behind the mission, not just the astronauts, but the ground teams at NASA as well. You know, our population at NASA now looks much different than it did back then, as we see in, in yeah. most other sectors. And that is a wonderful thing because it is showing that we can represent more people Hopefully we can represent everyone on the planet, but if not, at least we're representing more diversity than we were back then. Whether it's our backgrounds and our experiences, like you said, there were certainly no biologists that were astronauts in the Apollo program. 
But those elements are so important because, you know, you look at countless studies here on Earth where you have teams that are diverse in terms of experiences, their life experiences, their education expertise. You put them together and you have a much more, a much higher functioning team, a yeah. much more successful team, and a more content, happier team. So you can expect that to be true with these missions now, and we see that already on the space station. You know, we have diverse ways of thinking. So if you have a problem and you need to come up with some creative way of solving it, you don't want eight people that think exactly the same way. Absolutely. You want to have those differences. And so mm -hmm. that diversity does more than just representing everybody and inspiring more people and hopefully inspiring so many different kinds of people. It also should contribute to our mission success. You've been already practicing landing <laughs> on a very specific kind of heli helicopters. Yeah, we How have. So the helicopter training, I was in, in April, I was at an army base in Alabama flying the UH-72, the Lakota. Yeah. That was wonderful. You know, I've flown a lot of airplanes, but never a helicopter. And I would say flying a helicopter is much more challenging <laughs> and a lot more fun. I loved it. <laughs> and you know, it's flying a helicopter is not exactly the same as landing on the moon, but there are some similarities. You have this vertical profile. So we're gonna be coming down to a landing zone on the moon in that vertical way, like you do a helicopter. You also have some obscuration of your visual environment. So if you land a helicopter, for example, in the snow or in you know the, the in any kind of loose ground, you can kick all that up with the, the wash, the yeah. rotor wash, and so then you can't actually see your landing site. That will happen to us on the moon with the regolith as it's kicked up from the, the engines of the lander. So practicing in those kind of environments helps prepare us for those situations. It also is just something new and complex that we're forced to do using our brains, using our, our hands and, and our bodies as well. And that will help prepare us for this very complex mission of landing on the moon. Being a scientist, what is the main objective? What is it that you have in mind in order to get from the moon? You know, there are a lot of different scientific objectives. Uh, if you look at this first flight on Artemis 1, one of the big ones is, of course, you know, the biggest one is testing the vehicle, testing that heat shield, making sure it's ready to go. As far as the specific science, we have some radiation torsos on board this vehicle. That is a huge unanswered question still, or one that leads a not, needs a lot of development for when we decide to go even further than the moon and go to Mars. Radiation affects our bodies in different ways between males and females, and we need to figure out how to protect humans from this. So we have these radiation torsos that are mimicking the female yeah, body yeah, yeah, and yeah. different levels of protection, so that's really important. For the moon itself, you know, really geology is the big one, right? What we learn from these different samples, we'll be going to totally unexplored regions of the moon. The South Pole has a lot of frozen water, for example. Lots of different scientific possibilities there with that water. Also some logistical ones, you could use this hydrogen and oxygen to breathe or to make fuel. fuel. So that could help fuel and uh, support these future missions. So going to a totally unexplored region like that will answer so many different scientific questions. So, you know, we do luckily have some geologists in the astronaut corps too, and we're learning from the same geologists that trained the Apollo astronauts. They're still involved in our program. So wow. we're learning from the right people to make sure that we are trained as astronauts to make sure that we collect the right samples. Last question. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Victor Glover a couple of months ago right here. Do you see yourself walking on the moon? You know, that hasn't yet come to reality, I think, but maybe that will change after this launch. If this one is successful and these first missions are successful, there's actually a pretty good chance that Victor, that I, you know, my friends and colleagues, that we would be walking on the moon. It will be one of us. You know, that's the thing. Even if it's not me, I know the person. And that is an extraordinary feeling. So just knowing that I'll be contributing on the mission, whether it's on the actual mission itself or here on the ground in some way, is, I think, a dream come true for all of us as astronauts. Thank you, Jessica. D did you know that you have a huge fan club across South America, Spain? <laughs> I mean, it, it's unbelievable. <laughs> did, did you, how, were you aware of that? Uh, not really. You know, <laughs> I, you know, my mom's from Sweden, my father's from Israel, so I know I have a lot of support in those countries, but sometimes, yeah, it's just kind of random. <laughs> I can tell you, all across, all across Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina, Spain, they are, yeah, Jessica will be the first one. I'm sure, Jessica, I mean, you are, I mean... Oh, mm. wow. well, gracias. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, that really means a lot to me. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. Gracias. Un placer, la verdad, tener a Jessica con nosotros y seguimos en el Centro Espacial Kennedy porque siguen las entrevistas, ¿eh? Chau, chau.